Before we begin the sermon, I should once again point out to you that these are not my words I am reading here. This is a sermon that Pastor Hoff has written, uh, was preached originally in 2019. Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God is teaching us this morning that he desires from us, above all, faith in Christ and the preached word of God. And God rewards such confident trust in Christ and his word with the richest of blessings. In our gospel text, Jesus rewarded the official's faith by healing his son. But the blessings go beyond good things in this life. It is through faith in Christ that God delivers to us all the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. It is a fantastic blessing that we have so many examples of true faith in the scriptures. Abraham, Jacob, Mary, the mother of our Lord, the Canaanite woman whose daughter was demon-possessed, the centurion whose servant was sick, the official in our text, just to name a few. Such saints are recorded in the Bible for our benefit, that we might learn from them to hear the preached gospel of Christ and cling to it confidently, without doubting, firmly believing it. Let us get into our gospel text for today and understand how much God the Father desires and rewards faith in God the Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. At the same time, let us also be wary of how much our flesh resists faith in Christ and seeks to please God in every which way but faith. Our text records that Jesus had come back to Cana where he had previously performed his first sign or miracle, the changing of the water into wine at a wedding feast. We'll pick up the gospel lesson with these words. And at Capernaum, there was an official whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Capernaum to Cana is a 17-mile up and down walk. It's a two-day trip on foot for a healthy adult. This is a significant trip, and it's significant to think of, because the man, having heard that Jesus was at Cana, up and left his business and work to make the long walk to get Jesus and plead for help. Jesus had only recently begun his ministry. So far, he had preached, baptized, turned over the money tables at the temple in righteous anger, and performed one miracle, the changing of water into wine. As far as we know, Jesus had not performed even one healing. Yet this was enough for the man to set aside his work and family and to take the trip to meet Jesus to plead with him for the health of his son. Already then, with this official, we have a great and glorious example of confident faith. Here is a man whom we can all learn from and imitate. Having heard the preached word of Christ from Christ himself or from others who preached to him, he responded with firmness and resolve that Jesus is the one to be called on and trusted when there is trouble. Immediately then, we can blush with shame for our own lack of faith and resolve. Friends, we have been blessed with the pure word of God here at our Savior's Lutheran Church Sunday after Sunday, and week after week we hear proclaimed the great things God has done for us in Christ, Jesus' perfect life of obedience for us, his death on the cross for our sins. And yet, how cold and slow of heart we are to believe that God can help us in our troubles, or that God even wants to help us. And we are quick to wallow in anxious thought and worry instead of firmly believing that Almighty God is merciful and kind and forgives us our sins for Christ's sake and promises to deliver us from all evil, if only we believe. The official in our text had true and wonderful faith. He did not consider that Jesus would listen to him because he was someone important. He did not consider that Jesus would pay attention to him because he was holy and good. The man did hold an important position in society. He was a government official likely in the court of Herod. And while he may have been good and holy in the eyes of the world, the man put all that aside and understood that there was nothing he could do to impress Jesus. He came simply with his petition to heal his son. Like the prophet Isaiah, he understood that all his accomplishments in righteousness were as dirty rags, and he came with simply his cry for help. To such a cry, God always answers. Allow me to paraphrase the official. O oh Jesus, I am not worthy for you to help me. I am a sinner who has failed to follow your holy commandments. I deserve God's wrath and punishment, but I ask out of your grace and mercy to help me. My son is sick. Please come and heal him. 
How could Jesus deny such faith? He would not. But let us look carefully at how Jesus responded to the man. Unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. Isn't that a peculiar thing for Jesus to say to someone who comes to him with true faith and a humble plea for help? It doesn't sound very affirming, does it? Some might even say Jesus was insensitive and unfeeling. But it is the very thing that Jesus will do for the one with true faith. When the Canaanite woman came to Jesus and pleaded for healing for her demon-possessed daughter, Jesus rebuffed her with what many today would say were rude and intolerant words, saying that he came only for the Jews and not those dogs, the Gentiles. But you see, Jesus is more interested in giving faith and making it strong than being polite and dishing out compliments. So it is that Jesus is here testing the man, just like he tested the Canaanite woman. And he was showing the man where true faith was still weak and needed strengthening. And also here, our English grammar fails us. For when Jesus said, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe, you is the second person plural, meaning everybody, all of you. An American Southerner would say, unless y'all see signs and wonders. Here, Jesus indicts not just the official, but all of us for our sinful lust for signs and wonders and excitement, and for our reluctance to believe with our hearts when God's word is preached. Jesus performed great signs and wonders to prove he was God in the flesh, almighty over science and creation. But Jesus knew the hearts of men, that while they marveled at such wondrous and gracious works, it usually did not translate into true faith. And true faith is what God always wants. There were thousands upon thousands of Jews who witnessed Jesus perform fantastic miracles of healing and multiplying free bread and fish to eat and marveled at it. The same ones also listened to his excellent sermons and failed to believe. We too are guilty of being impressed with the things that excite our senses and neglect matters of the heart and fail to accept the pure word of God and believe it. Don't be deceived by your eyes and ears and allow Satan to veer you away from receiving God's word and sacrament. Don't let a Roman church deceive you with its grandeur and then poison you with ungodly preaching of salvation by faith and works. Don't let an evangelical church deceive you with a fantastic worship band and the, deceive you with their musical skill and then poison you with shallow theology while turning you away from simple trust in God's word and sacraments. Let us be content with the word of God faithfully preached by Lutheran pastors and with the sacraments faithfully administered. After all, it is through these, the preached word and sacraments, what we call the means of grace, that the Holy Spirit is active to save us and comfort us. So it is that we should be careful to earnestly pray the sixth petition of the Lord's Prayer. Lead us not into temptation, that God would guard us and keep us so that the devil, the world, and our sinful nature may not deceive us or mislead us into false belief, despair, and, the other, and other great shame and vice. And so it is that unless God is our helper and strengthens our faith, we wilt before the temptation of grandeur and excitement, which lead us away into false belief and other great sins. And it is why we need to pray to God for help to guard and keep and strengthen our faith. Jesus tested the official in our text and rebuked him in order to strengthen his faith. Jesus knew that this man, like all of us, allow our sinful flesh to lead us away from the simple trust in God's word by that which excites the eyes. Therefore, he calls on the man, and he calls on you today, to repent of breaking the first commandment to have no other gods, and fearing and loving and trusting in other things, temporal things, things that we can see, instead of worshiping the one true and invisible God. Now, I suppose, after this rebuff, the man could have wilted and walked away with discouragement, perhaps thinking that Jesus was not as kind and merciful as the reports had said, and as the man had first believed. But by God's grace, he did not wilt. He persevered in believing that God is good and merciful, kind and forgiving, powerful and righteous. And so, that he steeled himself against doubt, as we should see, and persisted in his plea. He repeated it and said, Sir... Come down before my child dies. It was as though he said, You are right, Jesus. You have exposed me and pointed out the sin of my heart. 
I have been led away by the lust of my eyes, and I have erected idols in my heart. Even my son has been an idol, and I have feared and loved and trusted in him rather than you. And I looked for comfort from him rather than you. For this, I deserve punishment. Nevertheless, have mercy on me. Forgive my sins, and out of your great kindness come down before my child dies. And so it was. When the man persisted in his faith, he received exactly what he desired. And Jesus said, Go, your son will live. And the son was healed at that moment. What a wonderful Savior we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Out of love for us, he became a man and went to the cross and died for our sins. And out of mercy for us, he gives us faith and the Holy Spirit through his blessed word and sacrament. Not only that, he wants to see us endure in the faith unto the end. And so, out of love and compassion, he tests us to strengthen our faith and make it more sure, able to endure until he comes again. This is what he did for the official in our text. Notice that the man's true and wonderful faith still needed strengthening. How do we know this? By the fact that Jesus at first rebuffed him, yes, but notice that the man insisted that Jesus had to come down and heal his son. His faith was not as yet as strong as the centurion that we read about in Matthew and Luke's gospel, who understood that he was unworthy to have Jesus come under his roof, and who believed with firmness that Jesus only had to say the word and his servant would be healed. And Jesus did exactly that. So the official in our text, while he had true and wonderful faith, needed to learn better the power and mercy of God in Christ, and that Jesus did not even have to be present to heal and save. Likewise, all of us, and the most educated of all Christians, have things to learn. The faith of each and every one of us needs informing and strengthening, lest we fall away. In the end, let us learn from this text to persevere in our cries to God for mercy, as did the official in the text. He could have wilted as many do when his faith was tested, but he refused to doubt in the mercy and kindness of God in Christ. Likewise, let us steel ourselves against unbelief and not allow ourselves to be tempted and fall into false belief, despair, and other great shame and vice. Rather, let us be faithful to cling to God's word, fearing, loving, and trusting in him above all things. Amen.